Following the first episode of CD Projekt Red's Night City Wire, we discovered that a wide variety of media outlets and YouTubers gained early access to roughly four to five hours of Cyberpunk 2077 and were able to post their impressions online. There have been a ton in the way of impressions posted, and via these you hear about what people thought about certain features, whether they liked it, didn't like it. Many have been covering the overall impressions, which have been large in part positive, but even further through this you get a lot of comments and remarks around what exactly is present in Cyberpunk 2077. And put simply in this video, I went through 20 of these articles, videos, spent like a good 12 hours reading all of them and compiling it into one nice list. So now we have a much more comprehensive and just overall better look at what exactly these impressions were. And even further, many of the new features or little aspects of this game that were described in them. As at many times, one impression gave us a decent look at a certain feature, but then a different impression actually took a bit of a different thing away or could flesh out those features even further. So I spent a ton of time trying to go through just about all of this to hopefully give you a more comprehensive look. If you guys do want to get subscribed, I have quite a few additional side Cyberpunk videos that should be coming out this week, but with that said, let's go through the new features we found out about as well as some of these impressions. So one of the first big things to take into consideration as we go through this, and honestly for me, a huge red flag throughout a variety of these impressions where a lot of them didn't make it clear either how they played the game or what was not enabled in the game. So it seems like some outlets actually got five hours of hands-on time and some outlets got four hours of hands-on time. In particular, some of the Australian outlets seem like they got more time, but even further, it seems like they were able to play each of the three life paths. So although some outlets only could start the game as either a Corpo, Nomad, or Street Kid, some others got to test several, or at least that's the way they made it seem in their impressions. Even further, some were playing this game physically, others were having it streamed remotely to them. This varies, and I saw several outlets just not clarify one way or another, which is kind of a big deal. As far as the streaming, I didn't see any complaints around that, and even one pointed out how the latency wasn't super discernible. But even further, there were actually several features disabled in this build of the game. It seems like this was mostly universal, regardless of where you were playing it, some of these features were just not turned on yet, but things like crafting were not currently on. At least for some of the Australian demos, it seems like ray tracing shadows and reflections were disabled. For several of these demos, they were only able to play the game on a controller, and considering I haven't seen one impression actually specify they used a keyboard or mouse, I think almost all were required to use controllers, which is interesting. Vehicle customization wasn't in this demo, but it seems like it has been overall removed from the game. So yeah, the reason we didn't hear a bunch about crafting or vehicle customization is because they literally couldn't do those things. One of the other ones that varied was in character customization. Some could customize the more intimate parts of the body, not getting specific because monetization, and then some others couldn't. Although reading through all the previews, I was able to fill in those blanks, so it wasn't a huge issue. But speaking of that, let's start with character customization and what we found out about that. The character creator for this game is described as having depth. There are a lot of options in this, in particular Grizz Gaming listed them all out. So there are 252 different individual options to choose from, although things like face molding don't seem to be there, but even there's some odd things, like you change voice types, teeth, nipple types were an option. We don't have gameplay of the updated character customization system. It was described how what they got to use in these impressions was different from this shown last year. The character class system was described as fluid, where you had seven points right off the bat to put into body, reflex, intelligence, technical ability, and cool, with six being the max rank of each of these individual stats. Although seemingly they apparently started at three three in this demo. And although your overall attribute rank was relevant, where things really got fleshed out was within the subcategories of perks under each attribute. So while the cool attribute affects your stealth, speed, and crit bonuses, it also has the two subsets of perks that with stealth and cold blood. And in this, there are 240 perks in total spread out among all the subcategories under attributes. And just as one example for cool, the stealth category has 26 perks and the cool blood category has 19. And some of these perks actually have multiple levels or some other perks were described as being locked until you spend a certain number of points in the prerequisite perks. So ranking up these perks is going to be a huge part of this game, and there are a lot of different avenues you can take this. And it was really described as being fluid. You're not forced into just min-maxing, you could go kind of across the board, putting a few points here and there. And the way you'll upgrade these attributes, and more specifically these perks, are by leveling up. And apparently towards the latter part of the game, you can potentially get more perk points, where in the earlier part you'll just get one per level. You also just had flat out abilities around some of the weapons. 
Although there are a variety of weapon types, the classes of weapons are rifles, handguns, and blades. Blades also including blunt melee. And just by using rifles, handguns, and blades, and let's say getting headshots, getting last hits, you do increase your ability with them. It's not really like you spec into this category, at least based off this, it's just you use them, you do the right things with them, and you'll get better with them. We'll talk more about weapons later in this video though, because there was a lot to say about that also. Another big part of this game though was street cred. You complete street cred by completing jobs in some of the various districts for the fixers of that district, and what it allows you to do is use better items. So as you level up your street cred, you'll gain access to actually use a better sniper rifle or a better armor. It wasn't expanded on too much just because I don't think many people got opportunities to really explore this aspect in this intro. Again, they only had four or five hours in total to play, including a little prologue mission. And then lastly, not really direct as far as character customization off the bat goes, there also is cyberware. It doesn't seem like anyone really had a super explicit list on what's available, but it was described as being from your eyes to your circulatory system, how there are 20 slots in total on a person and even further how your UI will change based off this, which I believe is something we've heard from past interviews, with one example being that your ammo counter will pop up if you have the appropriate cyberware but not otherwise. Although outside of that, let's look at the life paths that are available with Cyberpunk 2077 as this was another topic to get a lot of coverage, and in fact we have a basically comprehensive look at the three of these and how exactly they start. If you're not familiar, your life path will more or less be your starting circumstance in Cyberpunk 2077. It's who who you are and where you came from and this will have impacts throughout the rest of the game. Of course, we only know from the first five hours, but apparently all throughout this first five hours, you can make choices or have dialogue options based off your life path. Although all three of these have their own unique prologues. And in fact, that life path based prologue is what you actually see in this brand new gameplay we got. It's the three different life path prologues all snapped together in different ways. For the Street Kid Life Path, you're going to start at the El Coyote Coho in Haywood. This is basically a bar and it's the scene you could find where you're snapping your nose back together. You have an option to take a drink or not take a drink to numb the pain. Something kind of cool CD Projekt did with this is, for all three of the life paths, you start looking into a mirror, and you can see this through the gameplay. That's just seemingly the way you start off the game, it's the very first scene you'll see after customizing your character. Which I really like, you customize your whole character, probably spend a ton of time in that, but then once you jump into the game world, you could immediately see what it really looks like. Although, and we'll talk more about this in a little bit, at least based off the previews, there isn't much as far as seeing your character outside of this initial instance. With this particular life path, you're going to start off by helping the bartender solve a debt they have with a local fixer. So you go to the fixer and you are tasked with stealing a car. But something pretty interesting here, as you go to that car to actually steal it, you'll find a unfriendly Jackie there. More or less, he's telling you to go somewhere else because he scoped out this car first, so it is his. You have a few choices as to how to handle this situation, but in the end, the cops come and you both end up getting taken down by the cops. And this is what kicks off your friendship with Jackie. The backstory of the street kid is you are returning to Night City after two years away from the city. And as far as some of the examples of how being a street kid will help you in the game, it's mentioned during one of the quests you knew some background about a chem that was being given to you, which seemingly you wouldn't have known that information had you have not chosen this. The street kid one was fairly simple, as far as the corpo one, it's actually quite a bit more complex. Choosing the corpo life path, you start out as being sided and working for the corporate leader of the area that was Arasaka. And in this particular life path, Jackie is in fact your friend from the get go, and pretty soon after starting you actually hear from him on the phone. You also are looking into this mirror where it says to trust no one. Your boss calls you into his office. Basically something went wrong and a different executive at the company is calling out your boss to take responsibility for this mishap. So our boss gives us some money and says to take care of her. From there, we go on this cool flight where you actually land at Lizzie's bar. This is where you meet up with Jackie. We saw a lot of this throughout the gameplay. Since you are a bougie corporate drone, you tell the driver of this vehicle to land in the basketball court and just disregard those people and get in that fight. Although apparently you can choose not to land here. And I swear, literally every impression that chose the corporal life path described how you can shoot the basketball from the half point line to immediately get a swish because you are cybernetically enhanced. I've read that almost exact line like nine times. So then we go into this bar with Jackie, but then that person we were responsible for taking down actually shows up, or at least some of our minions do. They spike us with something where we get a virus so all of our implants stop working, we lose access to our bank account and seemingly all of the money, and it renders us unconscious. This is where you go into that driving scene with Jackie, and apparently there is a way to sweet talk your way through a roadblock, but overall through this you lose those corporal benefits right off the bat. Although you do get to keep the money that was given 
given to you by your boss to orchestrate the hit in the first place. I'm not sure if that gives you an added benefit over some of the other starts, if it's a significant sum or not, but even further, one of the other cool details around this one is, since you start in the Arasaka Tower, you can actually explore it. This down to finding your own desk and actually reading some of your emails at your desk. You don't have to do this, it's not part of a quest or a mission, it's just an optional activity that you can go exploring. Also that varied HUD that we're seeing during the gameplay is as a result of being an Arasaka agent, but we lose that once we have the virus implanted in us. Then you do have the Nomad. Here we're going to start in this Badlands garage scene. Basically we are ripping off our old Nomad logo in this mirror. We used to be with a certain gang, but now we left that gang to go on our own. The town is very small, it's just a garage and several trailers mixed throughout. The thing with Nomads is, since you are, well, a Nomad, you are very well versed in traveling via cars. So you know a lot about cars, and that's why we have this intro scene on fixing a car. The sheriff shows up, and apparently this sheriff very much so was a stereotypical small town sheriff. He didn't like nomads, and even further, didn't like us because we were an ex-nomad gang member, so we're an outcast among outcasts, or at least that's supposedly what he says. And then from there, we have a job with a local fixer named Willie, where we are doing a package pickup working with somebody named Jackie. With this one, it doesn't seem like we're really friends or against Jackie from the start. He's just an acquaintance doing a job with you, and as a result, you become friends. And in the end, you relocate to Night City. So the interesting thing about all of these are, you actually have several similarities despite all three being drastically different instances. One, you start off looking in a mirror. Two, you end up meeting Jackie and befriending him. It seems like you have to befriend him, it's not an optional choice. You probably can make some mean decisions towards him, but you end up as friends in the end. And all of these actually end with a time jump, roughly a six month time jump, where you'll cut to being driven home by Jackie to your apartment. And we know that in Cyberpunk 2077, there's only one apartment as it almost acts as a plot device in some way. Our apartment's located in an area known as Watson, which reportedly has an Asian influence and was described as having big skyscrapers and a pretty crazy view of all of this. In the immediate surrounding area, you could see things like noodle bars, crossing lights across the top, as well as kids running around, but we'll touch more on that in a moment. The various districts were described as having very distinctive presence and cultures. The art style from one district to another kind of chose something from the 90s to the 2070s, and it was emphasized how, via the gameplay, as you went from one district to the next, you really saw a totally different looks, very similar to those cards CD Projekt posted a while ago. This was very much so represented in the game. The styles were changing from architecture to advertising, what people were wearing, who was around, and even sometimes how they would react to you. A lot of these NPCs you could talk to, I got kind of conflicting impressions on this. Some said how there was a ton of NPCs you could find, but not many had meaningful dialogue or dialogue at all, just those generic NPC one-liners. Others described how in the crowds they were actually surprised by how many NPCs they could talk to, although apparently these NPCs will react to you if you follow them, they'll turn around and be like, hey, why are you following me? Or if you stay at them, they'll actually look up at you like if someone was on their phone, they would stop and pause and look at you staring at them. The citizenry in general came in a wide variety of shapes and sizes. The fashion was described as very futuristic, and you could actually scan the people you see for interesting information. A lot of them had minor stuff, but some had interesting backstories, and in fact, there were some bounties you could get this way. The crowd and pedestrian AI overall, just the movement of groups, was described as impressive. Although the crowds may be slightly smaller than we've seen in some of those past trailers, described as roughly 10 to 20% smaller. You can go full GTA and start taking people down and cops will show up, but it takes a while, it's not as quick or as simple as in GTA, you have to do some pretty bad stuff first. Even further throughout this, you can go through some different gang controlled areas, each of the districts has a different gang associated with it, but just as you're walking, you might go into a different gang controlled area and find gang fights breaking out. This from minor verbal altercations to full-on gunfights with explosions, or other times finding the Night City PD fighting against some of these various gangs. It was described how they captured the city never going dark theme pretty well. Like you would see in a modern New York City, even though it was nighttime, there were those big neon lights that you could find in Times Square in real life that would illuminate the landscape and the streets. Which speaking of, the night-day cycle is one hour in real life is equivalent to eight in-game hours. Although you have to imagine stuff like that in particular, very subject to change. As far as how many buildings you could go into, I think it's kind of hard to gauge this. It was described how you couldn't go into every building, but you could go into more buildings than was expected. And a lot of these places you could explore, the little nooks and crannies or back alleys, there was always something interesting. Whether it be loot, potential craftables, or even some cool weapons, we could find NPCs being threatened or held up by other NPCs, people to talk to. 
and the amount of detail in even some of these smaller sections was described as immense. So that's where you start and how you get initially antiquated with Night City, what it actually will look like. But from there, following the six month time jump from the prologue or intro life path system to the actual main game, you actually start off the 2018 gameplay demo quest. So it kicks off with your new friend Jackie looking for that body in the bathtub. Basically the story was simple, a gang was stealing implants from people and you are finding that person. After this, Jackie takes you back to your apartment and it seems like following that things really open up. It will immediately transition you into that 2018 gameplay quest or alternatively you could just explore Night City. Something interesting about that 2018 quest though, it seems like there is actually a brain dance precursor to it. I don't know if this is a new addition, if brain dance is one of the newer features. The overall goal is to get this chip and the chip was stolen by a now deceased Arasaka CEO's son. The CEO was deceased and the son took the chip after the fact. We have to go through the CEO's penthouse in Braindance trying to find out where the chip was. We're technically doing this for Dex at the time, but you'll apparently have an option to turn it in to Evelyn Parker, which is one of the people high up at Mox, which is where you're doing the Braindance segment. You do see some of this in the trailer. And then seemingly following the Braindance sequence, you go into the larger part where you meet the Militech as you're on your way to the Mel from base. Apparently the goon jacks into you at this moment and actually gives you a lie detector test, which is reflected in his eyes. Depending if you lie or tell the truth, his eyes will change color. And then of course you saw this whole sequence with actually getting the bot itself. Although something pretty interesting, since so many people completed this specific quest, we get a lot of details as far as the variability or different choices you have during this. The final boss you had during this was named Royce, but you do have some choices here. Either A, you can take him down and he won't become the final boss, or B, you cannot take him down and he will be the final boss. You can just skip the military gear here and actually skip the negotiations overall. As you're going through the Maelstrom base, apparently you could find the former Maelstrom leader and he'll help you fight Royce, but you actually have to find him. He's in a cage within this building. You could go the Militech route, which is more or less what we see in that gameplay, and now as a result, you'll have Meredith Stout. You have to deal with her and you'll have some choices around that interaction. As far as within Militech, there's actually a rival to Stout, so you can choose to help out or side with the rival and that'll have an impact. And reportedly, if you stay neutral with that rival and you side with the Maelstrom, he could actually help you get out of trouble at the end. Which speaking of, if you side with the Maelstrom, then the Militech will attack the Maelstrom base, but the Maelstrom will help you out. And one of the cool parts about this, typically you would have to fight off Royce as the final boss, but if you help out or side with the Maelstrom, Royce will help you fight the Militech. So he'll kind of act as their final boss or through all of this you could just buy the bot with your own credits Just kind of go above the board the easy way and all of these depending on who you side with who you take down Who you don't take down during this who you find during this will have impacts on later quests But since basically everyone completed this quest during their impressions We got a lot of variability as to what the outcomes were following this if you do side with Dex or give him the bot It will take you to the afterlife bar here. You'll actually be at the bar with Jackie You'll get two Johnny Silverhand Hands, which is the name of the drink you're drinking and apparently the bar is very exclusive you really only got in thanks to your association with Dex and in fact this bar the afterlife has a pretty cool story it was formerly a morgue and there are pull-out slabs for tables but even further it is a very popular place for fixers or just the elite of this area to hang out as it actually has soundproofed rooms which is where you go to meet Dex that was the one specific quest but quests more broadly were described as having multiple levels of setup to them like as I described somewhat during that Maelstrom quest and getting the robot. It was almost like planning a heist in GTA. There are different people you're going to interact with, getting the different tools for the job, and at all of those avenues, you have different decisions to make which have an impact on the larger outcome. And in general, it was described how you're really never truly sure who would betray you. So you have to be really careful or take that into consideration. One of the side quests that was described, there really wasn't many details on this, is actually how there was a monk who was being forced to have implants installed in him by gang members you find him after the fact now very upset about the implants he has but you can actually go to the headquarters where they are doing this and actually take out the gang members and save this monk's brother who they're trying to do it to also but in the end this monk's brother is actually quite conflicted because he is against violence and although you saved him you had to use violence in the process and it was described overall as being one of those instances with a lot of depth to it. It made you feel or it made you think about what happened and how you did it. And apparently certain quests were level gated. It wasn't clear if this meant that you can't do them if you were in a high enough level or rather if it was just more difficult like it was geared towards a level 5 player but you're only level 2 so it's kind of ill-advised 
I couldn't find an answer to that question, despite, again, going through a lot of information. One of the funny things throughout almost all of these articles is it is very clear CD Projekt Red did not tell these influencers or media outlets that they would be doing a big demo and gameplay reveal of Braindance. Of course, that was one of the main focuses of Night City Wire, and I mentioned that because for almost all of these people, they used Braindance during their own first impression segment, and then they had these very elaborate ways to try and explain it without actually having gameplay of their own to show you. But they probably didn't realize that, oh, there would be a big demo that made it very clear, because at a high level, it's kind of abstract. It is somewhat hard to put into words if you don't have images to back it up. But to not just reiterate what we saw from Night City Wire, it was described how it really seems like Braindance would be a vital part of the story, something you use pretty often, Although it was one of the first aspects of the game to get a decent amount of pushback. Some people didn't really like this, and not just some people, but several people were unhappy with its current implementation. It was described as being somewhat clunky and at points slow and confusing. Despite Night City being pretty fast paced and throwing a lot at you all the time, the brain dance segments were somewhat of a change of pace and at points drew out, being a little bit too long that they stopped being fun. And a couple of impressions describing how they loved everything about the game, except except brain dance. Some other people thought it was fine. It never got high praise, but they didn't dislike it. Although one important disclaimer that was given was they only got to use it a couple of times in those initial five hours. So it could just be the intro ones are a bit lengthier or more drawn out as a demo of it, or even a tutorial on how to use it, and later ones will be a bit quicker. But then outside of that, let's move into some of the other more fundamental features, such as weapons. So weapons are broken down into three classes, power, smart, and tech. This being the type of weapon you could find. Power is pretty simple, just being raw firepower, firing bullets at your enemies. Smart will be some of those heat seeking weapons we saw from the gameplay. And then tech weapons are things like a magnetic shotgun using electrically manipulated firepower. And then again, as I mentioned earlier, you have rifles, handguns, and blades as far as those three classes that you can level up. Certain weapons have unique abilities like a cover system. Of course, as I mentioned before, weapons do have a level gate with street cred. You have to have a certain amount of street cred to use certain weapons. Gunplay got some mixed reactions. Some people thought it was fine, mentioning how enemies didn't feel too bullet spongy, but then others felt like in the gameplays we saw, it made it seem very kinetic, how things just go from one to the other, very fast paced, but in reality, it didn't really feel like that, with a few people describing how it was just okay. It's not destiny level gunplay, but it's not horrible either, and it could be something that you could use a little bit more polish. Although other NPCs did seem relevant in combat, at points you could wait back and let your NPCs like Jackie take down a bunch of enemies, and that was valid. Although NPCs NPCs were also described as being kind of blind, the stealth meter didn't really fill up super fast even if you were quite close to them, the sword combat in general not gunplay was described as not being very good, not being very fun. Melee combat is fairly self-explanatory what you'd expect. If you just do a quick trigger plus, it'll be a stab and jab. If you do a hold, it's a heavy attack and a left trigger is a block. But also this game does have a stamina meter around dodging and sprinting. And apparently somebody that had a fairly good cool spec, which does affect these stats, was able to sprint for 30 seconds continued, and then it took 9 seconds for the stamina bar to replenish, and actually dodge 10 times. It was described as being pretty forgiving in that regard, but even further, at some points, people just described how they had a bunch of enemies in front of them, and they just wanted to try to run. Run through them and see if the enemies would kill them, and although they had to use several health packs, they were able to get through it. We've seen the cover peak system in gameplay and it doesn't seem super complex, it's more or less just if you are towards the edge of a wall, it will peek you around the corner. It seems like weapon modifications could be a feature that is quite deep, but again there wasn't a ton of gameplay around this, it was just something that people kind of saw on the outskirts and it looked like, alright, there could be a lot of content there. Different weapons have different mod slots, but then of course the natural follow up to weapons, some of the vehicles coming with this game. Pretty early on after you complete that intro sequence, you do unlock your own car, which is a smart car. It has a little self-driving mechanic where just by hitting a key, very similar to Roach from The Witcher 3, your smart car will pull up for you to enter into it. It specifically is the Quadra Turbo R. As far as the driving overall, it seemed somewhat arcadey, kind of Grand Theft Auto-esque. It was described as having good weight behind it and good bounce at times. You can drift with the e-brake and even leave burnout lines, and different cars drive differently. For one of the people that had a Nomad start, the Nomad starting car felt different than their 
own personal vehicle they got later in Night City. Although for some, driving left a bit to be desired. It's very forgiving, so you could crash into things and even other people and you won't lose much momentum. You could actually jump on people's cars and apparently the NPCs didn't even respond that much. You could blow up the cars, but it takes a very long time and your car will just automatically fix itself after a certain amount of time. You also are able to steal cars very GTA-esque. You can hack into them, but you need a certain piece of cyberware or alternatively just kind of shoot the driver and take it. You are able to fire while driving the vehicles. And one interesting mechanic that was observed is that it seemed like as you were driving a car, there were less cars on the road compared to when you were on foot just walking around. As far as hacking works in this, very early on, you get the ability to scan around with cyberware. Via this, you can do a quick hack where you could just jam a gun, shutter some blinds, make a grenade go off for somebody, but hacking costs cyber deck memory. You could put levels into this so you have more of it or just level it up slowly, but it seems like the way this will work is there are different ways to hack things. That hacking minigame we saw, which actually wasn't very popular, is the cheapest way to do it, so it uses the least amount of cyber deck memory. And specifically, you do this while hacking a network, but seemingly there are actually other methods that are more expensive. Those are the more specific features we heard about, but there were also a variety of more miscellaneous ones. Apparently, as you're sitting in the car with Dex, his smoke actually fades and goes throughout the car. It doesn't just disappear, but actually has some physics or characteristics to it. Some missions are actually time specific and the city overall changes as time goes on. So for some of the bars, you can't get in until after a certain hour. And one of the crazy things about this, apparently you can pass time just by using a menu prompt. That's not crazy, but there's no load screen. So it just instantly switches from day to night. Unlike some other games like Fallout or The Witcher, where you have to wait on a little screen, that apparently wasn't a thing with Cyberpunk. And overall, it was reported how there were no load screens and really nothing even taking you out of the gameplay. As you're playing this game, outside of that initial cutscene you get, as it transitions from your life path choice to the actual six month later gap. So large in part, as you're playing this game, you are never locked down somewhere. You could always look away, stop the conversation. And again, there are no load screens, not even in elevators, or at least none that were found in this initial demo. There are a wide variety of activities you could find overall throughout the city, a lot of things that will pop up and populate that map, shops and jobs, NCPD gigs, fixers will reach out to you via phone calls as you enter into different districts that they control. So kind of just get a lot of this information thrown at you immediately. There's also bounties. After you upgrade your eye, you could scan those people and actually see some have a bounty on their head. You could do jobs for the Night City PD. Some apparently require you to actually hack into the PD, while others are just publicly available. They need help manning the police force, so they kind of enlist mercenaries like you. As far as some of the side content goes, the gigs were described as more substantial side missions, while jobs are smaller and more immediate. Like a job might just be a simple one, two, three fix, and you do one thing. Gigs have some steps involved. When hacking, it actually slows time, but it also uses energy while you're doing it, so you can't do it in perpetuity. There's this little side mission that may have more depth to it, where you could actually take place in an underground boxing ring, which is pretty cool. In the background of the world, at times, you could see rocket ships taking off and landing. You could scan around rooms for collectibles, although you do have a weight limit. There are lootable burritos, shards you could find, which are basically little lore booklets. When you find a shard, it might contain a short story about Night City or even a history lesson. And it seems like this will be one of the main ways to get that miscellaneous background lore. You can pet cats in this game. The way fast traveling will work is once you pass a point, you will unlock it as a fast travel point, And then from one of those fast travel points, you could fast travel to any of the other points you already unlocked. And apparently Judy is romanceable, which I know many, many people will be happy about. Although romanceable characters do have preferences. So you might go for everyone, but if they don't, they may not be interested in you. Keanu was not in this part of the gameplay in that first four or five hour segment, or specifically Johnny Silverhand, the character. As far as just a couple of miscellaneous negatives that didn't really fit in anywhere else naturally, inventory management at points didn't feel super good, it was kind of clunky. Overall, as far as inventory, we didn't get a lot, probably because crafting was disabled, but also how the game just overall throws a lot at you. There's so many characters and interactions right off the bat. You go from place to place, meet a bunch of people, and there's a lot of stuff happening immediately, so since it is such high pace, it could be alienating for some people. But as far as those overall impressions go, outside of just it being positive and overwhelmingly positive, it was also really looked at as a hardcore role-playing game. You can do what you want, you can make the character want, you 
you could say what you want and when you take all of that together there will be consequences for your actions you really impact this world there's a preposterous amount of choice and customization presented to you it's mentioned how the gameplay that has been shown during some of these presentations is representative of actually playing it itself how night city and actually getting to experience it for the first time is kind of breathtaking it really is an awe-inspiring city and world they've created here and that the trailers are just seeing it but not getting to play it doesn't do it justice how it just looks like there is a ton of content this will be a very beefy game especially if you want to do everything and how in some ways it was gta-esque in the exploration you just want to go out and explore after that is opened up you could do so whether it be stealing cars or causing havoc and overall the encounters you could find at times can be like a puzzle there's a lot of different ways you can do it but for the outcome you want you have to choose the right thing who to side with, how to side with them, and just in general, the most critical parts were definitely around the driving as well as the gunplay, but the RPG elements had nothing negative. It seems like they are plentiful and very well implemented. Although one thing I do want to note when it comes to those overall impressions, many of these first impressions weren't actually first impressions. A lot of people just had a short sentence or two like, oh yeah, the game is cool, I want to play more, but never got critical or even just kind of gave their opinion, a lot of these articles or videos were very factual. Some did actually go in on certain features, and that was nice to see, to see where things needed improvement or where things were really well done already, but I just felt like that was an important or good disclaimer to give towards the end of this one. But yeah, that is a lot of work. This video in and of itself took a lot of time to make, in particular, just going through this massive amount of information we just got. Although it hasn't been announced just yet, I really suspect there'll be additional hands-on demos as there will be additional Night City Wires, so that's something to look out for or look forward to in the future. But at least for now, as always again, I thank you for watching, hopefully you enjoyed this one, and I hope to see you all next time. Later.